The sermon text will be in Hebrews 4, 2. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. And then he will also be speaking in 1 Thessalonians 2.13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as, the tr as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. It's very good to be here, speak for my family. Very good to see your faces, see your progress in the past year. We have a seeming anomaly here. We have a gospel that is effective unto salvation. It's the power of God, in fact. And yet, some, they don't receive it somehow. There, there's, there's a failure of sorts, it seems like. That's what the text is talking about in Hebrews 4. Hebrews 3 and 4. Many times Paul, and through the Spirit, is referring back to this example of Israel, how many of them fell in the wilderness. They had it right to their advantage, and yet they fell. So there's, there's something going on here. And we're not going to talk only in the, the negative, as it were. That's why I had the brother read the text from 1 Thessalonians. There are those that believe. Remember, we are not of those that draw back unto perdition, but we are those that believe to the saving of the soul. So that's our affirmation this morning. But there's a high amount of, of learning and uh, even goading, as it were, that takes place by looking back at the example of those that did not believe, that prompts us, we don't want to be like that, see. There's, a, there's an objective and a subjective nature, as it were, to faith. This is like installment three. The, the brothers just before me have talked about faith and the gospel and the nature of it. So we're going to look at this matter of how faith and the gospel are joined together to be effective. Now this is obviously, we know this is a work of God, but that doesn't mean we're sitting back. It means we've got to put ourselves into it. We're fellow laborers. We're in the yoke. So we're working as hard as we can, but we're working to enter into rest. So this is a working, not of relaxation, but a work of submitting. See, we're, we're just entering into what God has done, and it's a good work. We're, we're glad. I just want to give you sort of an overview of some of the, the points I'm going to touch on, and then and we'll proceed. Some consider the gospel to be maybe a, like a take it or leave it commodity. You know, I, it's, a, it's an invitation, they'll say. I, un I understand what they mean by that. There is a beckoning nature to the gospel. Come today if you hear his voice. But it's not something that you can just walk away from. See, there's, there are consequences if you just walk away. Today if you hear his voice. Well, what if tomorrow? What if you're not in a place where you're hearing his voice? What if you can't hear his voice? See, that's what happened to the Israelites. They actually were farther and farther away from the voice of God, as far as their reception of it goes anyway. But we believe God. He commends it to us as his power and salvation. We believe that. We believe it's powerful. And we believe God is working. So that's why when we get together all these times, we stress and emphasize this matter of the gospel. And, and it's already, already been spoken to this morning. The, the gospel, of course, is the of a factual and an objective nature. Christ died, he was buried, he rose again. Our sins, brethren, have been put away. And we're going to also think of the, the subjective nature that we have to take a hold of that for ourselves. This is not something that just because it's out there it's going to work on you some magical, you know, ethereal way. You have, you have to know this for yourself. You can't know it for the one sitting next to you. You, ha you must know this for you. So we, we stress this when we speak, and uh, of course in our lives too, it's not something we just talk about, it's something we live. The, those that live by faith are the ones that are taking heed to the gospel. So if God is working through a particular means, this is a means of his choosing. I'm talking about faith. This is how God works. He works, when he comes, he's gonna be looking for faith. This is of his choice and his direction and actually of his making. So if he's doing that, we definitely want to avail ourselves of that provision. Faith, faith is key. Faith is utmost as far as us taking hold of God himself. Faith actually is like a receptive fellowship with God's revelation. God is showing and I'm believing. 
then he shows me more than I believe. See how those two are always linked and working together. And, and if at any point that starts to, if is cut off or starts to slide backwards, see, now that's a dangerous point. You want, you want to keep taking a hold of what God is showing. But the thing is, God is going to keep showing. And so you can continue growing in faith, from faith to faith. The Apostle Peter wrote it up this way. He says, we are kept, not like in a, in a room, in a prison, we are kept, we are maintained, as it were, see, by the power of God. But how is that? It's through faith. See, that's because of where you are. That's because of the domain of this world and even, even our own flesh that contends against us. But we can and we will be kept by the power of God through faith. So continue in faith. He said the outcome or the end of your faith is the reception of the salvation of your souls. That's where we're headed. So faith will get us there. The gospel will, inf will inform us as it will, and faith will take a hold of the gospel message and the realities, all the implications. The gospels, see these, these are not little things we take off the shelf, and today we're going to examine faith, and then tomorrow we'll examine the gospel. These things are all integrated together. You know that. But, but we're, making, we're making connections and understandings, and so the scriptures are joining together two and three and ten things together, and we're seeing how they relate one to another. And this actually, remember how it speaks in the one psalm of how Jerusalem is compacted together? That's what this is doing. It's compacting these things together in your, in your affections. We have come to know God as the creator, the creator, but he's also, more than that, he's a sustainer, he's a completer, of the works of his hands. But he's not going to do that apart from faith. Amen. See, I mean, even the world itself is going to be rolled up and, and done with someday, but the people that lived by faith, that's not their end. See, they're going to go to be with God. He's going to continue to work with them until that time through faith. That's how God's working with you and I, you and me. So we, we see the effectuality, that, that's a big word. What that means is it's really working. If it has an effect, okay? Look at, look at the root of those things. It's on display as the gospel continues to be proclaimed at times like this, but see, when you pick up the word, the gospel is being proclaimed to you. You, you may be reading back in the book of Esther and you see the gospel. Brother, Brother Aaron's been sort of going through a series, the gospel according to Esther or, or Mordecai or these sort of things. But the gospel, that's what God's doing. He's telling us he has something for us. He desires us to be availing ourselves of that. So it's, so it's our purpose and our goal to understand, not only just to talk about this as we get up, but to see this happening in ourselves, and we do. And we also see it in others, so this is twofold. You're encouraged by seeing it in your brothers and sisters, but you know what? They're seeing it in you. And so we're all working toward this, this goal that God has, to ensure an effectual work in us. So men take hold by faith of the, the provisions and the promises of the gospel. Now, all of, all of God is working to this end, the Father, the, the Holy Spirit, the Son, uh, the, the Holy Spirit particularly as he works in you to, to be a revelator of the scripture, of, of God's word as it is given to you. But one of the ways that we are taught, I think one of the main ways is by contrast, and that's why we have this text in Hebrews 4. It's, it's actually saying what not to be a part of. But that informs you greatly of what you are going to be a part of. So we're going to talk from Hebrews 4 and also from 1 Thessalonians 2. God is portraying the subject at hand in its, in its negative context. In other words, that which is to be avoided. There is an element to be shunned. It's 40 years of wandering around and waiting to die. That's the bottom line. One, one such outlay that is presented here in this chapter concerning the folly of those of Israel. They follow it. Now, you know what it says in Hebrews? It says that by faith, they crossed the Red Sea. So they, there was faith there, but at some point, they fell back from it. What, uh, another place it talks about, God said, they tempted me 10 times. So it got to this point where he said, back in chapter three, he says, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. It wasn't like he was fed up speaking as a man, but he was done. He had given and given, and there were those that took a hold, and they continued on. But the large, uh, large number of them fell in the wilderness. There's no lack on God's part, no lack of God's provision, no stopping of his voice. He continued to speak to them, as it were, through Moses, from Sinai and the giving of the law, all these things. He continued to speak, 
And yet, every day, several, maybe dozens, fell in the wilderness, waiting, see? But you know what? In the meantime, there were those that were growing up. There, were, there was a younger generation that was growing up that was going to take the land. So you can take that whole large picture and you can actually see that happening in you. There are things that are dying and there are things that are growing up into Christ. Despite the many miraculous works, like water that came out of a rock, bread that fell from heaven, shoes that didn't grow old, any, any one of these would have been enough to captivate, you would think, their attention. But it's not on the matter of just getting their attention and, wow, that's a miracle. See, it's not like that. That flesh is even wowed by a miracle to some degree. But see, faith, faith is different. Faith takes a hold of why God is doing it. It's actually, it's actually seeing God's purpose and seeing God's nature himself. But they were given the equivalent word from God as the gospel. Now, they, their gospel wasn't like we hear it in words. We, they, they didn't have 1 Corinthians 15, but they had this word that God was going to deliver them and bring them into a good land. The, the 12 spies that went in, it wasn't just Joshua and Caleb that brought back the grapes or whatever they were, right? They all did. They all, they all saw it. They all brought it back. They all tasted of it. And yet, how's the song go? Ten were bad and two were good, see? So there was a difference there. It's faith. Caleb and Joshua, they responded in faith. It seems like that's when the final testing or the provocation came after the murmuring that followed the report of the 10 spies. The, the two gave a very good report. They said, we're well able. See, that's the word of faith. We are well able. Not because they themselves, but because God had promised it to them. They said, we, we all, all of you, God promises to all of us. But no, the people murmured and said, no, this must be true. They must be too hard for us. So what, is, what does God say about them? He said they had an evil heart of unbelief. It wasn't that they were just discouraged. No, it was an evil heart of unbelief. When, he, when God looked at it, he saw men that were not believing what he had said. So that prevented the reception of this good news of God. So we, you know what happened? No more effectual work on their behalf. They're cut off from God working effectively. Now he did. There were ones that continued on and got into the land. The word preached then did not profit them. Hebrews 3.16, look back if you got your scripture open there. In the former chapter, it has this good note. It says, for someone they had heard did provoke, how be it, not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. So we see these two. Notably here, Joshua and Caleb. Joshua actually excelled. He, he, he succeeded Moses as God's leader of the people. Even in his very person, he was a type of Christ as a savior, even the name itself, Joshua, the, the one who saves. He was the commander of his people, like Jesus. He was the one that led them into the new land, the land of promise. And then Caleb, by his own testimony, he said, I have wholly, like completely, followed the Lord my God. That's in Joshua 14. He, so he was like maintained in a perpetual state of uh, youth and health and vigor for 45 years. He said, I'm 85 years old this day and I haven't lost anything. I'm ready. He was ready to go up and fight and he did. Why was that? Just, just, to, just to prove a point? No, he wanted to claim his inheritance. See, that's what faith does. It causes men to effectually claim their inheritance. We have a great inheritance promised to us, brethren, in the gospel. Both men then are examples, Joshua and Caleb, of those that to, who, to whom the word preached was profitable because it was mixed with faith. That's the only difference. I, I, I say that glibly, lightly maybe, the only difference. There's a lot involved. I don't, I don't mean it's just that simple. But faith, faith is not simple. Faith is an arduous work. But yet they believed and they maintained and so God maintained them. He kept them and they kept a hold of God. Amen. The gospel spoken to them did not include the details as we now know them, in particular the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, but their experience was a real deliverance. The people were delivered. They were, first of all, they were delivered from Egypt, across the Red Sea, 
Then they were delivered out of that wilderness wandering, and they were brought into a good land. So the factual details not being exactly the same, they're not the issue. The issue that we have here is the reception of God's truth. That's still the issue. We receive God's truth. I'm not saying the gospel shifts and changes and moves around. I'm saying the point of it is that Jesus saves. That's the gospel. The example of those who would not and did not enter in is not the only testimony. There was then and there continues to be by the Lord's mercy and by his help and by his grace a multitude entering into rest and believing. That's it, one of my favorite passages is this uh, Hebrews 3 and then on into 4. And it talks about this matter of rest. Seeing therefore it remains that some must enter therein. I see myself in that line. Do you see yourself in that line? Are you one of those that must enter in? Amen. And to whom it was first preached, they entered in not. He says, and then he talks about today if you hear his voice. So the invitation stands. Joshua did not give them this final rest that Jesus did. See, he's given us a rest more than going into a particular geographical land. He's given us a rest from the penalty and, and the power of our sin. He's given us uh, this uh, availing ourselves of all of the grace of his working in us to, to will and to do of his pleasure. Faith then is the differential. Faith is the element, the ingredient, present or absent. It either contributes to the effectuality of the work of the gospel or it testifies to the lack of it. If the gospel is not working, faith is not working. See, they're, they're workers, they're together. So the gospel then is God's purpose in Christ and it continues to be heard. How, how then is the gospel faithfully proclaimed and yet there can be still a lack of effect in the hearers? Well, consider this, Jesus himself coming back to his hometown of Nazareth and speaking there in the synagogue. Remember when he looked back and he spoke to the people, he said this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. How, how, how bold can this be? See, he's not, he's not mincing words here. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind and set at liberty those who are bruised. And then, a little bit later, there they are, taking him out to the hill to throw him off. See, he marveled at unbelief, Jesus did, and he marveled at belief. There, there were, these, are, these are primary opposite ends of the spectrum of human response to the gospel. So what I'm saying is that Jesus himself, as he preached the gospel, there was still this matter of unbelief that stood. So it's a, it's a strong, strong, sin is a strong issue here. Unbelief is very strong. And yet belief overcomes that. See, that, that's the ultimate, is that belief overcomes unbelief. And so our text and our message to you this morning is that you can believe. You were once in darkness, but now are you children of light. But there must be a pairing up or a joining together of faith with the gospel to impact the hearer. That's why the words here, when it talks about mixed with faith, these are intriguing words to me. I, I didn't look at maybe some of the other versions had a little bit different way to put it. But we're not talking about mixing like just stir it all up together and, you know, whatever comes out comes out. He's not talking like that, like ingredients in a pot. He's talking this matter of being mixed with faith means that they must be friendly the one to the other. They must be co-laborers. See, the gospel, the gospel like informs the hearer, but then it must go farther. Faith must take a hold of that and, and, and allow it to enter in. It's a deeper level. So being mixed is talking about companions. The gospel is a companion with your faith. It's a co-laborer together. Both must be active for this reaction to take place. The reaction of, of uh, effectuality is what I'm talking about. Both grace, I'm sorry, both the gospel and faith have their source in God. And we know that even in the Garden of Eden, this word was spoken that there was going to be a, a bruising take place. So that's like the, the proto-gospel there. It's at the very beginning. And as it developed through the words of the prophets and even a lot in the Psalms and things began to be spoken more and more of the Christ and, and the one that would come and affect this work, we see that faith is taking a hold Men and women are taking a hold of this all along the line, all down through time. So 
they're, but both have their source in God. God is promoting and uh, getting out this work that he's going to do by speaking to men. And they're, then they're speaking to other men or they're writing it down and it's getting out. But there's also a matter of faith having a source in God. See, faith, faith comes in the, in the time of hearing. Not just because the person heard, but at the time of the hearing, that's when that connective point has its ability to take place. And God works in that. God desires that men hear and believe. So that's why it says, today, if you hear his voice, see, don't, don't turn aside, Amen. take hold. The, these must take, the hearing and the believing must take place while God is speaking. As mentioned a little bit ago, God continues to speak from heaven. This is a prime time for faith to flourish, brethren. We're glad for that. So the gospel is the record of God's working through Christ. Faith is the complementary engagement with that gospel. So whenever, whenever you're engaged with what God is doing, you're believing God. The initial acquaintance must proceed to a permanent bonding. That's why we have this, like in, uh, I think it's 1 Corinthians 10, talks about the same thing. It talks about they all came out of Egypt, they all went across the sea, they were all, you know, baptized unto Moses, and, and all these, they all had the man and these sort of things, but with many of them, God was not well pleased. So there must be a permanence that comes forth, but the thing is, God is able to do that work. He is able to finish that which he has completed. And not just is able, that's his desire and aim, and that's what he's doing, really. That's, that's not just a goal, that's the outcome of the gospel working with faith. It's the salvation of your souls. Think of the parable of the soils in regard to this. There were four, there was like a range of four, different, the, the spectrum of believing and, and growing in the parable of the soils, but it was the last one. It was the one that had the, the good and honest heart, the one where the fruit came forth, 30, 60, and 100 fold. He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So you work out your own salvation. Just work it out. Just enter into God. God's working it out. Just work it out. Not just work it out. Work it out. Work it out. It's hard. Work it out. God will, God will continue to work because it's God that works in you. You, you think, I thought through scriptures, there's many more. I just touched on a couple. There are like the scripture puts together like couplets of effectuality. Think of Samson and then think of Samson with a jawbone in his hand. Now something's getting done, but it was God working in that. The jawbone laying on the ground was doing nothing. And Samson, without that, well, it remained to be seen what could happen, right? But see, that's like the gospel and faith. When they're coupled together, there's an effectuality that takes place. Amen. David with his sling. And later, David with the sword of Goliath. The sling slew Goliath, and what that did is, see, it led to more things. He, he wasn't going out into battle later with the sling. He was using them. Remember he said about the sword, there's none like it. I get the impression he, that became his sword to use after that. So see how faith works? It, it actually increases. As faith is joined together with the gospel, more effectuality is brought about. You're, you're more firm and rooted and able to continue on. Amen. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. See, that's an effectual work. If the brethren are just scattered, well, it, it, it may be good here and good there in pocket, pockets, but how good and, and pleasant it is for them to dwell together in unity. It's the gathering together that brings the effectuality. Jesus is bringing, he's, a bride is bring, being brought to him and he's bringing a great number unto God. He's not bringing us individually one by one, well, let me introduce so-and-so. See, his church is going to come with him. All the sons are coming unto glory. Primarily, though, this matter of effectuality, we see it in Christ and his church. I know all these other small uh, examples are ministering toward the one end. You and, and, and I, we are fellow laborers with God. That's a great commission. That's a great expectation, and yet it's not one that's falling to the ground. See, as, this is one of these texts that as we're gathered together in this room, it's actually happening. We're speaking the gospel, and our faith is growing. See, and, and you know what? It's effectual. You're going to go home and you're going to be 
better spiritually speaking than you were before you got here because God's working. Amen. The gospel and faith then do have a continuing relationship. They do continue to walk together. They are agreed. Neither expects the other to go it alone. Each or both are providing an atmosphere of compatibility and conduciveness for the other. This continues on. As the gospel is preached, faith flourishes. As faith flourishes, it more and more is able to take a hold of the gospel. You know more about the gospel than you did a year ago, two years ago, four years ago. We've been, like one of the brother, brothers said, we've been talking about this for years, but we're not going to stop because, see, every time it benefits us. That, that's what effectuality means. It's always in the upward direction. What is the effectuality of the labor of the gospel and faith being mixed with it? Well, if you want to start thinking from the, the largest view, eternal life is. Eternal life. We're looking for eternal life. We're looking for the saving of the whole, the body, soul, and the spirit. We're looking for the day when we are with the Lord. Also, though, the effectuality isn't just a forward look, something afar off. The, the effectuality of the gospel and, and faith working, working with that is day to day. The just shall live by faith. It's not just something down the road. So we have a safe and a confident passage through this life because we're constantly believing the gospel. Now, I don't mean confident like you don't stub your toe. I mean in regard to the things of, see, sin would, sin would raise its head and it would say, well, you know, God really doesn't have an answer for that. He, he really won't forgive you of that sin. But what the gospel says that he has forgiven sin, he has put it as far away as the east is from the west. And so believing that gives you a firmer footing to travel forward. It's also the gospel and faith working together, they together provide a valid testimony to men and to angels. There are a great cloud of witnesses looking on, men and angels. There are angels that are, that are uh, even co that are, uh, helpers together of those who will be the heirs of salvation. Now these, this testimony is concerning God's faithfulness in this work. The, it's not a testimony of how well I did. It's a testimony that God is faithful in this one. Mark 4 reads this way. It talks about those which are, it's talking about the seed, it talks about those which are sown on the good ground, those that hear the word, those that receive it and bring forth fruit. That's the gospel. That's faith taking a hold and continuing to bear fruit. And also our ministry continues to those of like precious faith. Let's talk for a moment about 1 Thessalonians 2.13. Sometimes when I, sometimes when we have a text and it, it has a, a tone like this, unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but it did not profit them. There is a lot of understanding that can take place in that, but I'm glad that there are texts like this where Paul actually wrote to ones that were flourishing and demonstrated this, and uh, many times he even mentioned names. So 2.13 of 1 Thessalonians, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. When you received the word of God, which ye heard of us, you received it not as the word of men. And that's important. See, receiving the gospel is not receiving the word of men. It has to do with how God has spoken concerning his son. He's the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Remember, it was asked to the disciples, Who do you say that I am? Jesus said. We're not receiving the gospel with a a twist on it or a certain spin on it. Receiving the God, there's a lot of gospels out there that, ha that are the word of men. But as it's received as the word of God, that's when it's able to be effectual in you. He says, and you did this, as it is re received in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So the exhortation is to continue to receive, continue to believe. So the gospel is mixed with my faith, with your faith. It has an ongoing, increasing measure of operation. Can I, can I discern the gospel being enlarged in me? Can you, just, can you see it being enlarged in you? Well, you can, if you, if you just think about it. You can see it, and what's the response? We give thanks. We give thanks unto our God that he's working, working mightily on, on our behalf in this. And then also, we give thanks to the brethren. 
we build up one another in the faith. We, we commend, when we see something in one another, see we're actually able to commend God's work in them. And that's not a matter of pride, that's a matter of rejoicing unto our God. There is this matter of this neutralizing opposition, that which would contend against the gospel and contend against our faith. So what can I, what can I do about that? Well, sometimes there's this question that comes to us, what can I do without? What can I do with? What, see, Paul, when he was on that shipwreck, they had to throw a lot of things overboard. See, sometimes you have to throw things over. Sometimes you have to clean out. There's other, you have to lighten the ship. This, this, uh, it's like the ark. It had a lot of, a lot of animals in it, but the, the water bore it up. But there's, sometimes we have to, th to put things out. But there's also times to lengthen the cords, strengthen the pegs, and uh, add more things. So we'll be able to discern these sort of things as God continues to work with us. And then uh, lastly, when the gospel and faith get together, what this does, and this is dear to our hearts, it brings us close to God. See, faith, faith is not something that's uh, mechanical or something that uh, you, you can measure on paper or, or see a list of things you need to do. It has to do with the affection of the heart and God's affection toward you. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. He loved you in the giving of Christ. And so this engenders in us, and faith is active in this, in bringing us close to God. What does the gospel say about Jesus and you? Well, it says that he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. See, so that we through his poverty might become rich. This is the word of the gospel that our faith takes hold of. So I encourage you to continue to believe it, to digest it. And I want to read uh, a text from Isaiah 30. It talked about the, the prophet was talking about a rebellious children. He's talking about the same ones in Israel, ones in whom there was no faith. But this is joined together with what Paul was speaking of here in Hebrews, to the Hebrews, about this matter of rest. It's a better rest. It's not a rest that they were given just by getting into a, you know, a land and not having a conflict with their enemies and, and having blessings of the land. But this is a rest where they're not any longer in contention with God. There's no longer any any uh, anything, nothing between my soul and the Savior, the song says. So he said this, the prophet said, in returning and rest shall you be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. 